Welcome to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. Hi, I'm Wanda Costa. Hi, I'm Karen Song. We're the filmmakers of the documentary feature film project of the same name that's still in progress. This podcast series is an extension of our film's mission to affirm and extol the courage, vision, strength, and joy in our LGBTQ community through the preservation and sharing of our personal stories and the collective histories we live through and change. We often discuss whether it is still necessary to come out today, since there is a level of acceptance and visibility that did not exist in the past, with many rights won for our community. We also discuss coming out as a celebratory and self-empowering moment in one's life. But we want to also acknowledge that for many, it is still very difficult and unsafe to do so. For all of these reasons, we want to emphasize why we do this podcast, because we believe these stories were as timely then as they are now. We believe in the importance of telling and preserving our personal stories and our collective histories as forms of visibility and activism and as sources for empowerment and inspiration. On this episode, it is our deepest pleasure to feature our beloved Leslie Cohen, someone you might have often seen, but not necessarily have known it was her. She and her partner of 44 years, Beth Suskin, sit out in front of Stonewall all day, every day. They were the models that posed for George Siegel in 1979 and are immortalized in the sculptures at Christopher Park in front of Stonewall. And Siegel, despite being a highly established artist at the time, had a hard time finding models brave enough to pose for the statues that would commemorate the 1969 Stonewall riots, which marked the birth of the gay liberation movement. Leslie was a pioneer. She was not only out of the closet, but out and proud. And because of that, made a huge impact in so many ways. Leslie was one of the five women who, in 1976, created the first club owned and operated for women by women, the legendary Sahara, which was located at 1234 2nd Avenue at 65th Street. This was no small feat then or even now. But then it provided a safe haven from the seedy gay nightlife, which was wholly run by and exploited by the mafia. It was a time when it was difficult for women to even obtain a state liquor license to open such a business, where a husband or a father were required to sign the necessary legal documents. Sahara was a new vision for a woman's space, elevated, celebratory, and above ground. And Leslie brought her sensibilities, having worked in the art world, to bring to it its salon-like vibe, which would attract celebrities who appeared or performed there, such as... Jane Fonda, Tom Hayden, Patti Smith, Pat Benatar, Nona Hendricks, Warren Beatty, Gilda Radner, Jane Curtin, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, Bella Abzuk, and Elaine Noble, the first openly gay state representative. Her legacy of contributing to our community and history is rich, and it is rooted in love first and foremost. Love for her Beth and love for her community. But to get there, she had to have the courage to embrace each and every step of her own journey. Here's her coming out story. I was born in 47, and I was raised during the 50s, a time where homosexuality was really considered a perverse pathological condition. And it was something that we never discussed or talked about because they were considered perverts. Anyone who was gay or lesbian was a pervert in our minds. And, you know, as a kid, I mean, basically something that I wouldn't even entertain. Went to high school in 1962. I graduated in 65. You know, the history of pre-Stonewall, how uh, gay and lesbians were treated, having to be totally in the closet because they could lose their jobs or their children. People were even being castrated at that time, if not thrown in jail. That was what I grew up around. I have to let you know that I never had an easy time. Yeah, I had a couple of crushes, but I was so different than my girlfriends. You know, once we hit puberty, we're boy crazy. And I tried to be. I tried to act like everyone else because I wanted to belong. I desperately wanted to belong. And I didn't have any alternatives in my mind because... Gay and lesbian wasn't on the radar. If it was, it was so taboo. 
So I tried desperately to fit in and like boys, but I always was like the last one out. Make out parties and spin the bottle. I was always like the last one, you know, (laughs) who got chosen. (laughs) But that was just the way it was. I had these little things, you know, in high school with girls that made me question the girl who came over from high school to my uh, apartment in Queens, my mom's apartment and laid down next to me on the bed and we were talking and she started to rub against me, my knee. And I I pulled away, you know, and it was like, that was it. End the story, you know, being in camp and, and really falling in love with this girl and, you know, lying in bed all the time with her, not, not having sex, but just wanting to be in each other's arms and constantly wanting to press up against each other and hold each other until she said to me that, there was something wrong with this and we couldn't do this anymore. Because we actually used to go into the, into the bathroom stall and hide so we could hold each other. And it broke my heart. But I remember looking at her photo, staring at her photo in my 11th grade trigonometry class and saying to myself, why am I staring at this woman's photo? And it was definitely something that was hidden. I didn't want anyone else to see this. I said, well... I don't know what this is about, and quickly changed my thoughts, moved away from it, as if my hand touched the hot coils of a stove, you know? I just couldn't deal with it. Went away to college in 65. During that time, still a holdover from the 50s and the the early 60s, and we were, you know, part of fraternity parties and all dating and all this other stuff. I did fall in love with a guy, but you know, I didn't know how to relate to him other than that I was turned on to him and I did have sex with him. That was my one experience. After that, I, I was pretty much chast and didn't do anything. Felt that I was different than the rest of the girls because I just didn't know how to relate to, to guys. You know, I describe it as like the feeling of like wearing wool in summer, you know, itchy wool. It just felt uncomfortable, not in sync with who I was. That went on through college, and, and then we hit the, the revolution, 67, 68, where everything changed. Everything was questioned. The civil rights movement, war in Vietnam, and the lies and the, the, the kind of life that our parents lived left so many people out, and we just questioned everything. The world kind of went crazy, and we kind of went crazy. It really was a crazy time, and it just lasted for years. We became hippies, and, you know, it was free love. It was like, why not sleep with a woman? We were hippies. If you're open to this idea, then you want to expand your universe. You want to be a loving, spiritual person and embrace it all, you know? So that was part of the atmosphere that I was experiencing. Lesbianism wasn't discussed. And I remember a few instances where somebody pointed a lesbian out to me. Like twice this happened in college. Once when I was in Europe studying in uh, in Milan and the Italian guys I was with said, hey, you know, she's a lesbian. And I looked at her as if she was some kind of freak. I wanted to stare, you know. I wanted to really look at her. And then I went to Queens College to get a master's degree in art history. And this was now 1969. The second wave of feminism was starting to really grow. But in 69, it started to get more and more radical. The feminism of 69 and 70 was extremely radical. But I had my first introduction to it. I found a newspaper called Notes from the Second Year, Women's Liberation, Major Writings of the Radical Feminists. It was a magazine that came out in 1969, and it was published by a woman named Shulamite Firestone. And there were articles by a number of radical feminists. The second year of graduate school, one of my fellow graduate students was living in the village with her European boyfriend. I was living at home in Queens with my mother in the one-bedroom apartment with my brother sleeping on the couch in the living room. You know, it was like this was a chance for me to experience this kind of sophisticated 
city Manhattan life. And I was so excited about going to this party that her and her boyfriend invited me to in her penthouse apartment on 105th Avenue. And I got all dressed, ready to go. And we went and then we went back to their little tiny studio apartment on Charles Street. I walk in and all there is, is this, it's, it's so tiny, double bed against the wall. And this like, you know, there's used to have these below up plastic seats. This one was like deflated in the corner. There was no place to sit, but on the bed. And so I sat on the bed on the edge and the guy, Jose, was next to me on the bed. And the woman, Helen, was also on the bed. I was like sitting on the edge. I didn't expect anything. You know, I was naive. And they put on this wonderful Argentinian mass music and they served me this wine. And I felt so cool. But I was a little nervous. It was tight. And I had no place to go. Helen gets up and goes to the bathroom. And I'm waiting and waiting. And Jose says to me, make yourself more comfortable. Lay back against the wall. So I did. And I kept my legs dangling off. Helen was not coming out of the bathroom. And I started to get concerned. So what happened? I said, Jose, what happened to her? He said, well, I don't know. She'll be out. Suddenly, I hear the bathroom door open and I turn around and there she is. She comes out standing stark naked in front of me and has her eyes glued on me. And I am now I'm like stiff as a board. I don't know what to make of this. I don't know what she's doing. I'm getting very nervous. She climbs into the bed on the other side of Jose and she leans over him and takes my hand. You know, this is 1970. I haven't had any of these experiences. I've, I've talked about bisexuality with friends and I just got very, very nervous. And I said, I don't know what's going on here, but I, I have to leave. And she started to cry. And then Jose said, okay, I'll take you to your car. He walks me down the, the stairs and I go to my car and I ask him, was Helen trying to come on to me? And he said, yes, she was. He, she's had her eye on you for a long time. You know, she was a graduate student friend. So that was that. I went home to my apartment in Queens and I just let out a scream like, the valve had opened. I went home. I thought about it the next few days. I said, what's wrong with you? You know, you're all talk. What's the big deal? Have an experience. See what it's like. You know, you're trying to explore your sexuality. Do it. Well, I saw her in school and I said, let's make a plan. And I went back to the apartment on another night and the three of us slept together. That was the first experience I had. She went off to Europe with her boyfriend to write her thesis. I stayed in the apartment. It was a wonderful experience for me. I was still interested in seeing where I was going to go with men. I didn't take it that seriously. I just felt like I had expanded my horizons. And a few months later, when she came back from Europe, you know, she wanted to continue the situation. I think we were together maybe one or two more times without Jose. And then I met a friend of my cousin's. I had another opportunity to get an apartment. So I moved into her apartment temporarily. It was like $69 a month and I had to split it with Siri. So Siri moved in with me and she was straight and I was quote straight. And then she started to talk about bisexuality. And then she said to me one night, that she'd like to have an experience. And did I ever have an experience? I told her I did. I was scared that if I talked to her about it, that she wouldn't want to live with me, that she'd be scared that I was a lesbian and I was going to seduce her. But it turned out that she wanted the experience and said, I want it with you. And we fell in love. We fell intensely in love. I did not know another lesbian. I didn't know where to go, who to turn to. But we were really deeply involved. We lived together for six months, but then she couldn't deal with it. She left me. And after she left me, I was devastated. And I, I mourned the loss for about a year. But during that time, as I was healing, I met some lesbians and started to go to clubs. And then I came out in a big, big way. Because it was like I burst open. It was like I finally 
discovered sex and sensuality and and passion I had never experienced with, with men. So this just opened the gate for me and I just charged through like a lunatic. That's basically how I came out. To realize that I was a sexual human being, to acknowledge my attraction to women, it empowered me in a very, very vital way. I felt like I could call my own shots in my life, that I was no longer going to be dependent on a man for anything. I accepted my otherness. I accepted my difference. And I started to relish in that fact that I was different. It emboldened me. It made me not have to deal with gender politics. I just felt like I was free and I was able to experiment with my own assertiveness, especially sexually, because I had never done that. It was all new to me. And so for that period of time, I was having sex with a lot of different people and loving them all, you know, in certain ways, you know, not in love, but loving them. They were friends and, I, you know, I cared for them. But at a certain point, it got to be too much. I needed to work. And this was taking up too much of my time and balancing these, these relationships. When I was with Siri, we decided that we wanted to find a place where we could go, that we could dance slow together because we were so isolated. So we figured we'll go to Greenwich Village and we'll walk around until we see somebody who we think is gay and we'll ask them where we can go to a lesbian club. And so we went down to the village and we walked around, but we didn't know, we couldn't tell who was gay or we didn't have the nerve to go up to anybody. We stopped at a diner to eat something. And the waiter came over and he was really flamingly queer, you know, very, very uh, gay in his dress and his attitude and his way of speaking and moving and everything. And so we said, where's the lesbian club? And he said, there's a place called Cookies and it's just north of here a little bit. Well, we didn't know. We looked it up. We spelt it wrong. I think it was spelt with a K and we spelt it with a C. We take this taxi. He ends up taking us to Harlem and he stops the taxi and he says, all right, this is as far as I can take you. And we said, why? He said, I can't go any further. You'll have to walk it. And we walk. And we're in the middle of a war zone. There were sections of Harlem, like there were sections of New York, in all different places that were very dangerous. And so this particular spot where this club was supposed to be was one of those spots that was very dangerous. And so it was a place that people avoided. And of course, the club that was Cookies was not obviously the club we were looking for. And so we had to find our way out of there. We couldn't get a taxi. No taxis were there. There were no cars there. We said, we're going to have to find somebody to get us to a bus stop. We had no money for a taxi anyway. We used it up. So we find these three guys. Do we take the chance? And we say, please, can you just help us get to the, to the bus stop? And they said, sure, no problem. And we started to walk with them. And then we started to feel more and more comfortable as we felt like we were being protected. And they had to make a pit stop as they wanted to pick up this pot called Chiba Chiba. And they were going to pick up Chiba Chiba. And they said, you want to come up with us? And they said, no, we'll wait here. And they put, kept the guy with us to watch us, kept walking, kept walking. Finally, we get to the bus stop. The guy said, hey, come on, smoke some Chiba Chiba with us. We said, okay. We go into this building and they pull a knife on us. And they put the knife in my side and they say, give me all your money. And we gave them what, like $3, <laughs> $4, which is what we had. Then I said to them, listen, I need a dollar for the bus. So he gives me a dollar for the bus. He says, that's it. Don't ask any more questions. He was scared to death. And finally they left and we got on the bus and we went home. When we were looking for the gay club in the village, I had read about Daughters of Bolitis, which was one of the first lesbian political organizations. So I went into the phone booth and I got information for Daughters of Bolitis. And when I called them, they wouldn't give me any information about a club to go to. 
And they said, we don't support those kind of clubs. Subsequently, I realized that the reason they wouldn't give that information at the time, which I didn't know, was because they were all, you know, mafia owned and they didn't want to support the mob. Eventually, we made it to Cookies, which was like, you know, typical mafia owned bar, still a lot of role playing. The owner, Cookie, was dressed in a suit and tie. And her girlfriend was done up with the, you know, lipstick and the long red nails and the tight skirt. And we felt like we were from another country, but we did get to dance slow. It wasn't until 1975 when I was now living with Michelle. Michelle and I were together about three years. I loved her and she's still one of my closest friends, really close friends. But we together envisioned Sahara which was a groundbreaking club in 1976 and the first women's club that wasn't mafia owned. That grew out of our relationship. My brother, who was a compulsive gambler, he was leaving New York and I felt like, well, this is a good time since he's leaving to share with him what's going on in my life. And so I was at the museum one day and he called and I said, Mike, listen, I know you're going. I want you to know something, that I'm gay, and don't tell mommy. I don't want her to know. I couldn't deal with the idea that she might reject me. It would just kill me. On his way to California, he stops in Vegas, loses all his money gambling, and has to return home and goes back to my mother's apartment to sleep on the couch. And he calls me one day, and he's back, and he says, Les, I think mommy knows. I'm now a total wreck. I am absolutely besides myself because I think I'm going to lose my mother. And I go home and the phone rings and Michelle picks it up and she says, it's your mother. And my mother gets on and she goes in her total like Jewish accent. She's very funny. She says, so I heard the good news. (laughs) And I said, you know, I just couldn't believe her. You know, she was really cool. Said, I started to cry. I said, Ma, I thought you were going to reject me. I thought, she said, you know, I, I adore you. I would, never, I would never lose my daughter. She said, I am worried. I want you to be secure in your life. No, honey, I would never reject you ever. And um, I just want you to be happy. She was very cool. She loved my friends. I even have a picture of her with me in Cherry Grove in 1976, where everybody's naked except my mother sitting with us, you know. They had to all deal with their own homophobia. But we were very close and we loved each other. And, you know, it wasn't going to change. The fact that I was gay was not going to change that for them. Fast forward. I was living a very gay life when I met Beth. But there's an insidiousness about homophobia. There's an insidiousness just that goes into you. You're not even aware of it. You know, back then, okay, this was again 1975, you wouldn't hold your lover's hand. You'd feel the looks and the stares and they, it would make you uncomfortable. And so you wouldn't do that. So by pulling back, you're already containing your own being. And that was what was subtly happening. It was, it was insidious. And you don't realize that. And even opening Sahara in 1976, I'm coming out in a big way. I mean... I am now like, there's no going back. I'm making this statement because I felt it was so important for women at that point who had no sense of pride, you know, who were going to these dives, these hidden lives, to be proud of who they were and to go to a place that made them feel good. When Beth and I fell in love in 1976, the fact that she found somebody in her life that she loved so much and that she was able to heal with being who she is, which is a kind of magical person. I, I look at her as if she's that person floating in a Chagall painting. You know, she's otherworldly in so many ways. And we were so mad for each other. And us coming together, she just refused to hide her love for me. Yeah, Beth had never been with a woman. Beth was straight. Beth was as straight as anybody could be. She always had been with men. She had never been with a woman. And 
we would go out to restaurants. This was a very closeted world at the time. She would kiss me. She would put her arms around me. Nothing would stop her. And I used to joke, how does it feel to bring a lesbian out? Because no matter how out I had become with opening this club, that aspect of being publicly out like that and showing affection like a straight couple would who are full and madly in love. We made that our goal and our mission because she said, I'm not stopping and I'm not listening. I don't care what anyone thinks. You know, she's had a naivete in a way because we could have gotten hurt by crazy people, but we didn't. We didn't. It had the opposite effect. It made people around us who witnessed it hold each other closer and smile at each other and move away from their argument, you know, and they stared at us and they watched us and it was uncomfortable, but it was more important for us to show them what two women in love look like. You know, my, my life changed when I met her because all that ambition and that drive that was, was focused on career became something else. It was, that was put on the back burner. My focus truly became on love and my relationship with her. And that was the most important thing in my life. And it remained that way for both of us. You know, we still laugh. How the hell did this happen? <laughs> How did this happen? And now we've been together for 44 years. And that was it. Leslie has just published her memoir, The Audacity of a Kiss, Love, Art, and Liberation, through Rutgers University Press, which will be out fall winter of 2122. You can also find out more about Sahara online at storiesofsahara.com. Thank you for listening. For more, subscribe to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. Please share your thoughts there on social media. And if you have a coming out story you'd like to share for a possible feature here, reach out to us. 